many people here for this course. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Susan Bourne. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science at UCT this year, and I've been asked to come and just welcome you to the summer school course on CSI, Truth or Fiction. Um, and it's good to see how many people, how much interest there is in, in this particular topic. Um, I'll confess that I'm a bit of a CSI junkie myself. Um, I can't say that I've watched all of the TV series, but I've certainly seen a lot of episodes um, and absolutely love seeing uh, the television version of how science can be used in the pursuit of justice. Um, at the same time, as a chemist, I must say that I've often wished that I could have a mass spec that could identify one single chemical compound from some mess scraped off the bottom of somebody's shoe. Um, so Maurice, if you can sort, sort that out for me, that would be really good. Um, so, of course, there's also, apart from the entertainment value, there's also a very serious purpose in um, understanding and, and, and broadening the public understanding of what forensic science can actually do. And that really, I think, is most likely to be the purpose of, of this course that you've all registered for for this, year, for this week. Um, if you look on the website, it tells you that this course will explore the myths, truths, and reality of forensic science and its role in the pursuit of justice. It'll show you how crime scenes should be managed, how evidence should be collected, processed, transported, and analyzed. And given the situation that we face in South Africa with the crime um, levels that we have, of course, it's not just the experts that need to, to know, know so much about forensics, but it's very helpful um, for the most of, as, as many people in the public to know and, and understand what forensics can do and what the limitations perhaps might be. Um, I'm not going to take very much of your time because I know that I'm not the person you're here to listen to, but I just wanted to assure you, of course, that you're in very good hands in this course. Um, the lecturers who've been assembled are all experts in many different aspects of forensic science, everything from anatomy to crime scene analysis, hair, DNA, fingerprint analysis, and a whole lot more. And you, they'll be telling you all about that over the next five days. All of them teach in the Biomedical Forensic Science course, which is offered at the master's level in the Faculty of Health Sciences at UCT. And I'm not certain, Maurice, but it's possible by the end of this week that you might have recruited a few more students, uh, which would be rather nice. Um, for this week, they are led and convened by Dr. Maurice Haynes, who's standing on the, on the right-hand side of, of myself. Maurice holds a PhD in zoology, um, and as well as an MBA, and she's taught aspects of forensics at a, a number of different South African universities, as well as universities in Ireland. Um, and I'll leave it to, to Maurice to introduce both herself and the other speakers in the course um, as, as you go forward. And at this point, then, I'm just going to welcome you all once again and wish you a really good week of lots of discussions, um, lots of, of interesting debates, and I'm sure that you'll find this both illuminating, entertaining, and, and, and informative. And wish you all very well. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. I appreciate the, the welcoming words. I normally don't need a microphone, but I've been... Maybe do it the other way around. If it doesn't fit, force it. <laughs> there we go. Um, yes, my name is Marie Haines. I've had a weird and wondrous career up to date, which I will tell you in little bits about it. I actually wanted to find out from you, first of all, who of you plan to attend all five days? That's lovely, because then there's a surprise for you coming later on, which I'll slip in closer to the end of it. Um, you're welcome, of course, uh, for those of you who only want to see today what things are all about, but you're welcome. I am a very interactive lecturer or presenter, so you're more than welcome to throw me with something, put your hand up preferably, but get my attention if you want to say something, um, because you are all people with a, you're not my students who know nothing. So you are all people with a wealth of information. So I might at times get things back on track because forensic science and forensics are so interesting, we can talk for weeks. Uh, so I, there, there would be a ultimate objective that I want to reach 
for the day and the other lecturers as well, presenters as well. So please bear in mind if I bring things back on track, as interesting as it is and as much as I value everybody's input, there might be times that I would say, let's get back to what we intended. Is that fine for everybody? Okay, and please, if you do throw something at me, no sharp objects. <laughs> but as the prof said just now, can you think of a country better than South Africa to practice forensics and forensic science? I mean, we are there in the world. Um, just to, yeah, now we start off already with a Houston, we have a problem. Doesn't matter, I can do it manually. What we want to talk about is crime scenes, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. So this is the type of image that you might be, might recognize from a um, uh, 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 typical entertainment value. But there's quite a few r things wrong with that and quite a few things um, that make me think, that makes me question things. So we'll be working our way through this. For today it is basically the crime scene. What should happen on a crime scene, what does happen, uh, what doesn't happen, um, and what, what, it in effect, what impact it in effect has for us. So myself, as the introduction said, I did a master's on the reproductive system of a sea slug, interesting little critters. <laughs> then I did a PhD on fetal alcohol syndrome, looking at the first three weeks of human pregnancy, where many women don't even know they're pregnant and might binge drink. Did my MBA at University Stellenbosch. Yes, I'm an Afrikaner. Um, that was my alma mater all the years. So many times people phone UCT and I pick up the phone and say, am I now at UCT? <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, I worked at University of Pretoria, University of Western Cape for seven years, and then in Northern Ireland where they've got this unique little hobby called kneecapping. So there, if society feels that you're stepping outside the bounds, they kneecap you. Nowadays, they don't shoot you. They're running out of bullets over there. They use a black and decker drill or a hurley stick. But they do it now in what they call a six pack. The six pack is they go for the ankle, knees, and elbows. So, six places. So, then my interest really got piqued um, about forensics, and I was involved in quite a few uh, interesting uh, cases over there. Then I was recruited here at UCT to come and run the master's course, probably not on my tremendous forensic skills, but more on the fact that I've been in universities for so many years, I know how the committee system works and how to get things going. And uh, all I can say after five, six years now, this course is tremendously successful. We've gone from strength to strength. Myself, I'm carrying on with forensic science research and also in the educational side of teaching forensic science. South Africa, forensic science, we've got many challenges. It's multi-leveled, it's complex, but basically forensic science is a scientific instrument that one can use, um, and most in the cases it's used by law enforcement to make findings. These findings assist the court. That's the forensic bit. And that can now help to exonerate the innocent and prosecute the guilty. In South Africa, we've got lots of wonderfully skilled and knowledgeable people. People normally have a, quite a, a vast knowledge of biomedical forensic uh, science as such, but they must now use it in forensic investigations. And we've got certain systems hampering it. We've got certain systems and practitioners working in silos. But the fact is, it doesn't matter what theoretical skills you have, you must be able to apply it in, practical, in the practical field. We also have to keep on with research in that, which is where the academics come in, and we must apply to the South African situation. So it's fine to say when you're at a death scene and you collect little maggots running, crawling around, get it to the lab as soon as you can. If you're in Kukanap, you're not going to get that maggot to me within a reasonable time. It will either be gasping by the time it gets you or it will, will be dead. So I can, there's no ways I can do... I can incubate it and breed it and, and have it hatch and then see what type of fly it is so I can determine how long the deceased or how long since the eggs have been laid on the deceased. So what do we need to do? We need to look into that DNA of the flies. So even if it passes, I can take it and I can identify it and say it was this species. I don't need to hatch it. So it's a South African situation. So from one single program, 
the M4 in biomedical forensic science, we have now grown so that we've got all these courses, the full research. The biomedical forensic science M4 is research as well as coursework. And this is now expanded to a full master's research as well as now possible in forensic genetics, medical microbiology, molecular forensics, forensic entomology, PhD in biomedical forensic science, forensic genetics, forensic medicine, forensic tox, PhD in entomology, and then soon we will have the PG dip for those guys who want to do a degree after their basic degree, they want to do a qualification after that, but the MPhil MSc would take you two years at least. So that's something one can do in one year. Is it mine? Oh, yes, that would be wonderful. Here we go. Okay, so that's the, the way it looks like now, and now I've done enough pitching. We do need funds. We do need lots of funds. But what we have done is there is no scientific society association academy for forensic science in South Africa. There's no one like a medical board that says you have to practice medical at this standard. If you don't do it at this standard, out you go. Or the lawyers or the advocates. There's nothing like that. Accountants. Everybody's held accountable because the public trusts them. And because the public trusts them, they allow them to do self-regulation. And we don't have that in forensic science in South Africa. So the concern is that anyone can spout whatever they want. And there's no one that can say, you don't measure up. So we are creating a forensic association, academy society. It will probably be academy because there will be it, courses that you can do, training that you can do. With that, we hope to have a, a, a credit, a journal, and you will have to register. And if you're not on that register, you can't give evidence in court. That's the Dutch, the Hollanders, they do it like that. Um, but the important thing for me is you must have a code of ethics. There should be a minimum, and you should be held accountable for whatever you spout. And then through that, we should also identify critical research needs. Right, the CSI effect. We had the reference to all the TV programs. That is actually now a scientific phenomenon, the CSI effect. In America where you have the jury system, sometimes, I'm so glad we don't have the jury system in South Africa. Where you have the jury system, everybody on that jury bench feels they are forensically educated because they've seen all the CSIs and the NCISs and the bones and all of that. The problem is, well, I'll show you a slide later on. Those programs are entertainment value. Nowhere in the world do you collect evidence on the scene, analyze it in the lab, and go uh, and arrest the person. There are reasons why there should be separation of knowledge. Imagine if I try to take a blood alcohol sample from a prominent judicial, judiciary person. I go and analyze it in the lab and I say, hmm, hmm, hmm. yeah, here we've got a problem. <laughs> and I have to give a, a report on that. So there's a reason why samples are anonymized when it gets to the lab. So that the people who work with it don't know specific too much. They have to know some things. I had a case, just when I started here at, U at UCT, a girl that's been murdered, hidden in a wheelie bin in a back room in a person's house. After a year, and this whole year, he asked the mother, have you seen the girl? No, she probably ran away or something like that. Meantime, he murdered her and hidden her away. So eventually it was discovered, samples were taken for DNA. We knew the potential mother. We knew the potential sister, but we had to identify the person. You have to do positive identification by scientific means. And a lot of our people, population, don't have straight ID photo images. They don't have passport photos. They might have a side view or a blurry photo, so you can't do a skull superimposition. And we had pieces of the scalp, we had femur head, we had DNA, and it was sent off. And bless them, the analysts did what they should. They got a sample, it's anonymized, 
They ran it through the SOP. Nothing wrong with that. But it was a year-old sample. There's no way they would get a, 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 a DNA result from that. So it came back. And in this case, it's now a high-profile case. And they've put some pressure on the lab. So we got results within a month. Took more. Had a tooth, sternum, vertebrae. Send it off. Again, no result. And then suddenly clicked, but why don't you do mitochondrial DNA? You need so much less. We have the mother, possible mother. And within a couple of days, we had a positive identification. But you can't blame the lab analyst, because they follow their job. But if there was a cover sheet to say, this is a year-old sample, and that person was properly trained, and not just trained to run the machine, they would have said, ah, oh, it's a year-old sample. I can't just use this method. Let's think out of the box. And things might have worked. Uh, different. But it worked. In the end, we had a positive identification. So how things have changed. For me, that was my first exposure to forensic pathology, was dear old Quincy. And things have changed now. From that, we got to bones, NCIS, mentalist, criminal minds, midsummer murders. Let's not leave, leave out our European group, body of proof, silent witness, it just carries on and on. And then we've had the, sorry, my language ability, don't go to that, but I assume it's something like CSI or NCIS. So there's loads, and you, all, you have to take it with a little pinch of salt, whatever you see in that. It is there for entertainment. So what have I learned from watching CSI? How to take a fingerprint sample, how to tell which direct and direction blood splattered from, how to think out of the box when faced with problems. All female CSIs can double for supermodels. <laughs> and you can kill someone with just about anything. But I don't watch crime scene shows for entertainment. I watch them for new ideas. OK, so um, I personally think the best, some of the best entertainment is not in what they show sci in the science value, but it is what they show um, inadvertently. And when you put them all together, I'm just, I'm just hoping this link will work. Doesn't seem to fit it. No, it's not working. Let's see if I, I'm going to go out of the show now because many ways to skin a cat, even with my technologically disadvantaged ability, but I know I can do a preview. Come on, right click, preview. And I am loaded, I am on internet. Okay, let's carry on. I will see if I can get back to that then at some point. But I do love um, that specific show with the sunglasses. <laughs> I think we've got our murderer. <laughs> this is now changed into murder. <laughs> that, that is a confession. No, man. Still doesn't want to. Let's see what happens now. Huh? Yeah, it's a, it's a video. Oh, it's a video clip. Yeah, a video clip. But it's fun. I, I'm sure that the audience is well versed in uh, David Caruso's um, handling of his sunglasses. There we go. Huh? Buffer. Oh, okay. You see there, I learned something. I'm always open to... Later on. Okay. It's like I 
analytical machine where you pop everything in here and the next moment it pops out. Okay, I'm going to play it later on again. Um, if you know the amount of information I want to convey, it might be better if we move on to the next slide. So if we look at crime scenes in South Africa, you all know that the SAPS, the South African police, owns the crime scenes, theoretically, temporarily, for a period of time. So what will happen is there will be an event and someone will call in, telephone, in um, the event. Let's say it might be a crime. So there will be a call taker at SAPS that will take down all the details. We also can call them a dispatcher. They will send people off. So normally they will send out a first officer, probably someone already on the road, and say, we've just had a call, suspicious uh, activity at this house, please go and investigate, shots were fired. And then the first, of, the first officer will go to the scene and will send information back to the dispatcher. Yes, we have a murder. Um, I will need forensic pathology services. I will need this, this, this. I will need ballistics. There's a gun involved. And some are K9 as well because the guy ran away. And then the dispatcher will send all of the people out. There will be an investigator of, investigating officer appointed who will take charge of the scene. That investigating officer will perhaps call out the local criminal record center. That's where all the scientists would be. Those will be the guys who take fingerprints, take crime scene photos, um, make uh, uh, tool mark impressions, those kind of things. Eventually, it might also be that they will need someone from the forensic scientific lab, Plattekloof. So there might be a ballistics. Um, so there's someone trained in ballistics, how to retrieve a gun. Someone committed suicide, and he still has his finger on the trigger, and they must now collect the gun. I'm not going to touch it. So they'll get a ballistics guy to come and do it. But if it gets more complicated than that, they might get the guy from the lab to come and, come and assist. The SAPs might then also say, listen, we need Department of Health, we need the forensic pathologist, and they will go out to the scene. They are automatically called in certain things, like if there's a sexual assault, if it's a scuba accident, child um, sexual assaults, those kind of, there are specific events that they should come out. And then when forensic pathology services get involved, they will help with the documentation and recording of things on the scene and then the body will go to the mortuary and then they'll do some further investigations and they might then draw body fluids that will go to the chemistry lab for analysis. And very often forensic pathology services on the scene or at the mortuary will call some speci uh, specialists. Like this morning I was called to a salt river to go and collect some maggots and um, samples from a deceased that was found on Friday. Uh, so yes, anthropologists can be called for skeletal. Um, Taphonomists can be called for body found somewhere in the mountains and it looks as if there's some disturbance. Myself for entomology. Um, there's lots of paperwork and lots of reports. But here at UCT, what we do now offers some assistance in. We have FACT, which is the lab that works with anthropology, skeletal material, dry stage of decomposition almost past the stinky stage. Myself and Devin Finnegy, we uh, work with taphonomy and entomology, so that's the bloaters and the creepy crawlies. I'm starting a new unit, Aqua Force, that's to do with the triple Ds, drifting, drowning, and decomposition. Yes, ma'am. Taphonomy is all the changes around at the time of death. So let's say a body, a person falls, like someone from the United Nations had a fall on, on Table Mountain. And then around the time of death, there were certain changes. So the body might have bloated and shifted. And now when you get there, it's not in the position you would have expected it. But there is no third party involved. It's purely the movements of the body at that point. And my drowning, drifting, and decomposition is more to do with, should a person drown now, where should we go and search? Um, she's asking that if we work with entomology, do we work with helminths or any of the intestinal 
um, animals or just the fly, the eggs and the insects that come after death. In entomology, in our case, forensic entomology will work with insects only. Um, then our Salt River Mortuary is being rebuilt. We're all excited about it. There will be a new institute where we will do forensic pathology services. I'm saying we, I'm UCT and uh, very much also involved in FPS. We can do their own blood analysis, entomology, anthropology, odontology. It's a one-stop shop. So things will be much more contained. Chain of custody will be much more assured. So that might be the last year that you'll see this view if you drive down there. Um, this will change, and we're all so excited. Okay, crime scenes, what to do. This is normally what will happen at a crime scene. You'll have your crime scene control and management. This is like the terminology used by SAPS. There's a report, there's reaction, you prioritize what should happen. You will conserve the scene, as in protect the evidence, make copious notes, search for more evidence, process the exhibits. You may, can also process persons, like get affidavits and statements from, from people. And you, do, you apply then investigative aid. Investigative aids will be your fingerprint expert coming to brush or your, uh, the other experts that you get. Processing of? Processing of exhibits will be how you lift a fingerprint, for example. Um, if there's a bottle that's been broken and someone has been stabbed, on that bottle you would expect some fingerprints or DNA even. So, it's how you work with that exhibit and how you package it and how you send it off to the lab for further analysis. Persons would be interviews that you have with people. So SAPS then trains according to this. There's the event, you report it, you activate. That's when the dispatcher sends people off, respond. Okay, well, let's skip all the terminology and just chat about them. That first guy that gets sent out to the scene, guy or girl, sorry, man or woman, person, police person, takes control of the situation. They, first of all, the prior, prioritizing should be the injured. Uh, are there any people injured? And that takes first priority. Life over anything else. Then that person, in effect, takes a handover from the public. The public called, there's a problem, and they hand it over to the first person on the scene, which is the first officer. The first officer needs then to identify what happened, presumably, and establish a command center. And for a time being, that person will be the temporary command center commander. I love their little acronym, CCC. The CCC is then there to administer all resources. What do we have to our, at our, um, what can we use? What do we have on the scene? And then how to use it. That whole command center, if it's a huge thing like a mass disaster, plane that fell, or a ferry that capsized, not just slow down, or a bus in the Toyskluf tunnel, or Kuburg, God forbid, something happens there, then it can become a joint ops center. It can be in the field, and it can even become a formal joint ops center. Documenting the initial, they have to make notes of what was said by whom um, and at what point. That first officer must verify their addresses when they get that call out. Make sure that they are at the right place. We've had numerous situations where that didn't work. They have to verify the time they arrive, make notes. They must use all their senses. Stop. Don't rush in. Look. What do you see? What don't you see? Listen. What do you hear? What don't you hear? Smell, do you smell anything? What don't you smell? Observe. Um, also look at things like, is the light on? Is the window closed? Is the ice still melting in the glass? How long ago do you think there's been movement in this place? You have to reflect on this theory of transfer, low card principle. But as I said, first one is life over limb. If there's any, a person injured and Hopefully the investigating officer have walked in, felt for a pulse and said, okay, this person is injured, walked out and identified a route for the emergency personnel to follow 
that will do the least damage to the evidence. And we have interesting little um, uh, crime scene aids that looks like a, like a tray, and it's got four little legs, and you put that down and you walk on them. And it's see-through, so you can actually see what's be beneath them, so that you don't inadvertently step on something. So you have to secure and protect. That first member will then give a situation report, a CITREP back to the dispatcher. The dispatcher will be de determine who to send. I mean, people, this is wishful thinking. The guy comes there, ooh, blood, death, smelly. Oh, guys, we've got a, I almost said Mursha, huge problem here. Send everybody. That dispatcher sits there, they don't know. They send K9, they send ballistics, they send forensic pathologists, they somehow call the, the Navy to come and assist as well. <laughs> Anything. So the guys get there, they say it's a, it's a taxi war, and then it is a disgruntled ex-wife shooting someone. So by the time everybody is up in arms, they've now got to prepare years now, Cape Flats gang warfare, taxi warfare, and then in the end it's... So unfortunately that is idealistic to say that they should make their decisions. But the dispatcher then determines who to send, theoretically, and we call that the appropriate investigative unit. People selected because they need to be there. The first officer cordons off the crime scene, and there will be a detective from this appropriate unit who will become the crime scene manager. Sounds very nice. And that will be deemed the second handover. So the crime scene manager arrives and the first officer hands over to that crime scene manager. The next few slides is all to do with how do you define the crime scene boundaries? Where do you tie that tape? Because obviously you, if, if I find a body here in this room, where am I going to close off this crime scene? Okay, I was just going to see if he's awake and not just sleeping like some of my students by the end of the day. But all exits and entry points must be covered. How do they get to this room? Is there a lift? Then the entrance to the lift must be closed off. Probably going to close off all floors and the building and the road outside. So the, the problem is if you're too conservative, the idea is to make it as big, the crime scene as big as possible because you can always bring it back in. But if you cordon it off too close and people start trampling around your scene, then you lose evidence. So, and you also think where might, okay, <laughs> this doesn't work because my lecture rooms normally have windows. So you kind of like, don't assume someone will run out the door. They might climb out a window or use a, not a indicated one. That big, don't assume, it's very important. So that's how you define a crime scene, set up physical barriers. I'm just going to jump here for time-wise. But people can contaminate the scene. That's why you need to cordon it off. Yes, the suspect, the victim can contaminate. You know, I'm angry now. Someone broke into my house. I'm going to find this person. I'm going to see if he's hiding anywhere in the house. And they go stomping around the house, seeing if someone is hiding in the other rooms. Family members, friends, pets. Animals, especially in the field, gnawing little marks on it. Emergency response personnel, bless them, they've got a function, but they do kind of stomp all over the place. Investigative officers, especially the ones that aren't that experienced yet. High-ranking government officials. It is amazing. You have a crime scene, especially if it's like a semi-high profile. They don't even know yet. Sometimes they just come to the door and look in and maybe throw their toperki down. But they want to see what's going on. Now your investigating officer or the first officer on the scene that's putting up this cordon is a constable. And here the brigadier comes along and he now wants to look at the crime scene and this is a kind of career limiting move. <laughs> no, you can't come in here, but that's what they have to do. Onlookers, souvenir collectors, thieves, news media. And then, of course, the weather. Not that we've had lots of rain in the last while, but rain can kind of damage your scene. Yes? You, again, you have to look at 
how people could come in and how evidence could be removed. So how a person could move, how a vehicle could move, lots of tape. And of course, the, you, can, you can cordon off streets, but sometimes they <laughs> don't tie it onto something that can move, like a vehicle or a bicycle. <laughs> that does happen. Just hold this for a while. <laughs> So you need to minimize crime scene contamination. So the way to, to prevent contamination, the best way is just to deny anyone access. That's it. But sometimes someone has to go in there. But that's the best way to do it. After that, you let the people dress in PPEs, protective clothing, gloves, booties, ice cream suit. And last thing, you make use of a crime scene log. So every person that enters that crime scene has to enter the same place where someone is standing and logging who goes in and who comes out. So the crime scene log, one entrance, one person taking details, and for those, it's for exclusion, so you need to, oh God, we've got a problem. What do you do if you, when our database now gets working in South Africa, you have an exclusion database where all police persons, EMS, medical personnel, Forensic pathology officers get on that exclusion database. But now you also have a criminal database where some of our police and forensic pathology people will be, and EMS will be on. So that's going to be a bit of a problem. But at least here, you have a list of who got there for legitimate reasons. So at least that, you don't automatically assume if you go through the evidence collected, it's a policeman, oh, he had to be there. If his name not on the list, then his DNA shouldn't be there, or his fingerprint shouldn't be there. Interestingly enough, if you go and read some American um, guidance, then they say, you must collect fingerprint shoes. Okay, we just take a photo of the shoe, if we have a camera. Collect fibers, collect from the clothing, blood, saliva, pool there, and or pubic hair. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll collect their evidence, but I'll rather take normally. And then eventually, um, the scene will get released. But that investigating officer, before he releases the scene, after he's done the court, and he needs to just go and sit and write down as much as he can about what happened. That's one of the big problems we've got in the South African crime scene. The scenes are a problem, and the translation in court is a problem. But the scene is a problem because people think their memory is infallible. They will remember who came when, what, where, and you don't. So they need to make notes and copious notes. So when the investigating team arrives, they have to prompt them and tell them what happened. They have to share detail. They have to discuss why they made the perimeter where they did. And if they collected fragile evidence, which they can, they need to um, hand it over as well or tell them they collected it. So what they shouldn't do is be afraid to challenge superior officers. They sometimes wait too long to contact the investigators. Yeah. <laughs> should I, should I not? Especially when they're inexperienced. They sometimes assume that it's a suicide when it is actually not. Or they assume it's a natural death. And we've had cases where the police signs it off and says it's a, it's a natural death. And then FPS comes along, and forensic pathology services have got, they used to be a, um, SAP, South African police. So there's lots of guys with lots of experience. And then they either pick up the body and find a murder weapon underneath, or they collect the body and they see, but uh, things doesn't make sense. Something is wrong here, and they go and pull the curtains away, and there's a broken window. So never assume. They fail to detain people at the scene, and I mean, every situation is diffi different, and it's sometimes difficult. If you, one or maybe two, the community is upset, the people want to run away, what do you do? You're supposed to cordon off, and you're supposed to detain people, and you're supposed to keep witnesses, and you're only one or two people. Not securing a big enough area, failing to monitor, guide, and supervise medical personnel, no note-taking or observations, Volatile crowds, as I say, is a huge problem. People want to clean up, believe it or not. They want to get them out. They want to, they want to handle the 
trauma, the situation. They want to do something. And sometimes they just want to chase the people away. The media is very often difficult. And the example here is for an officer, the body was naked, it was a rape, um, a rape murder, homicide, and the officer could, um, got a blanket and covered the body with a blanket. And eventually they found German Shepherd hair on the deceased. Um, and the hair came from the, the officer's blanket. But the suspect had a German Shepherd and then the, the, it was basically uh, catch-22 because you couldn't say that it was his or the officer's. And the same with O.J. Simpson. Nicole Simpson's body was also covered with a blanket and that was also gave an gave avenue of defense. So your crime scene managers, they would then do a first walkthrough and that walkthrough would be from the crime scene manager, the investigating officer and the crime scene technician. Uh, yes, the crime scene technician. These are the guys coming from local criminal record center, the fingerprint guys, the photographers. They will all wear PPEs, at minimum a mask, the full ice cream suit, food, uh, booties, food, uh, shoe covers, gloves, double gloved most of the time. And they will, as they walk through, plan how are they going to manage the scene? What are their processing strategy? What methods will they apply? But the crime scene manager has the responsibility for managing and investigating the scene. And the crime scene manager appoints the investigating officer. The investigating officer <coughs> is what we call the principal investigator. That one handles the case docket, sometimes only at that point. Because they hand in their docket that evening, tomorrow morning at Parada, they hand their docket over to someone else but they are technically responsible for the docket. Many times, the crime scene manager is the investigating officer. So the investigative team needs to be coordinated. That di diary needs to be kept of what happened. They have information gatherers. Those are the people working with the different types of evidence. Witnesses will be interviewed and statements taken. So that's the process. Um, the crime scene manager appoints the CS technician, that's the processing expert, the guy who will lift the fingerprints, um, scrape evidence, swab blood, body fluids. And then eventually um, more specialists can be made available from the, as I said, the scientific laboratory or forensic pathology service or the university. I'm running a little bit behind what I pro projected at this point, so I'm going to run through just finalizing what, in theory, should happen according to SAPS. The processing team will prepare a visual representation of what they deemed happened, and that will go for, for court. So they will locate, recover, and document physical evidence. A final walkthrough, after they've now collected what they wanted according to their strategy, a final walkthrough will happen. Yes, sir? That's a very good question. This visual representation, remember you work with, in court with lawyers. And if you ask a lawyer, why did they go and study law? They say, because I couldn't understand science. So when you get to that stage, unfortunately, you have to draw pictures. You have to have things that open and close and nice little color diagrams. So you have a, almost a carte blanche. You have crime scene um, software that you can do reconstructions. You can do animations. Unfortunately, the average investigating officer preparing their docket will have Word, maybe PowerPoint, with some standard little pictures that they can use. But it's something that you will, or even an enlargement. If you have a fingerprint and you have a, 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 a accused fingerprint, you have a latent fingerprint from the crime scene, even if you just make a big mock-up for the judge, magistrate, so that they can see why you say it's a match. Um, then finally, you will have a final walkthrough. You'll have a debriefing by all the key players. That's the point where you should think, did I now do everything that I wanted? Most of the time, isn't it? Thank God I can get out of here. Um, you release the scene back to the public, and then after a while, there's supposed to be a critical evaluation of that specific case that they can reflect on what happened, what didn't happen. If you guys have been, I'm pretty sure, how many of you have had criminal events happening to you? Yes, you see hands. I mean, 
uh, or no, if I say the next sentence, everybody's hands go up. Or know someone who had it happen to, then everybody will. But if you see a crime scene that's being investigated in South Africa, you'll see the following. Your crime scene manager, who's a detective, will wear a red jacket, a little bib, or a vest. The investigating officer who carries the docket will have a blue jacket. His team that supports the investigating officer will also wear blue jackets. The crime scene technician who's coming to do the swabbing and the fingerprint lifting, they wear green jackets. And then the crime scene processing team, the rest of these guys that help to make a sketch of the crime scene, that help to measure where the things are, they will also wear green jackets. So this is the typical software that you can use. Someone was murdered, you went and you measured the distances of things from the walls, where things were found, and then if you have the software, you go and make a nice little reconstruction. But you can see there, there's a broken window, there's a broken window, there's blood, there's a glass, there's a door. So where will you cordon off? What will you do? You will cordon off even the road because one of the witnesses says the guy ran out of the door down the road. So you'll cordon off the road. But your first instinctive would be to walk straight to where the person is lying. The idea is actually to take the path least tread, is to walk around to try not to disturb any evidence that might be in the direct or the logical path. So processing methodology, these are just how you process the evidence, what you look for, and you should always be, like you, you see a person on the bed, you take photos, you collect, the, the, there's some feathers around the mouth, and you collect the pillow, and then the FPS comes to lift the body, and then we see something else, body fluids. Now you have to go back a step, you have to bring back the photographer with his little scales to come and take photos of this. A far off photo, a medium range photo, and a close photo. And then only you can swap that. So you actually have to go back a step and then forward again. Um, low card's principle, every contact leaves a trace. That's the whole thing that low card is all about. There's a victim, there's a perpetrator, and evidence is exchanged at the crime scene. So Dr. Edmund Locard, he's one of the first criminalists he said in his theory of transfer, whenever two objects come in contact with one another, they each leave and take something. There's always evidence of this exchange. It's like two color balls. It's all like cricket, you know, that when they have the hawk eye or whatever they call it, and they play that and they say the ball did nick the bat. So that ball left that little fluorescent dot on the bat. And, well, apart from the sound that's gone. But, um, Offenders leave something of themselves, like fingerprints, DNA, footprints, sometimes just the impression, and the offender takes something from the scene, fibers from the clothing of the, let's call it deceased, swell of the scene, DNA. So the walkthrough is then when you start making a, you start playing around with scenarios, what could have happened, where you try and avoid assuming the first thing that jumps to, jumps. Um, into your head. I'm gonna, uh, no man. Um, what you should do of any evidence or things that you think is evidence, you should write down these kind of things of everything that you think should be collected. The quantity, the item, the color, the type of construction, is it wood, is it plastic, the approximate size, any features that you can identify with, the condition and the location. It's just to put it in context. There are different types of search patterns that you can use on scenes, and I'm going to whiz through that now. End of the matter is you have to, oh, that's a good one, look up. It's more, almost like the Vietnam movies where they say you walk through and then they say, just look back and look up, you're going to miss something. Same with a crime scene, look up. Might be other evidence on the roof or in the, above the crime scene. So when you search and you collect and you package, um, people are, we still on, should I start giving you opportunity to ask things? Must I carry on with this? Okay, so you're searching for biological evidence. You've got different search methods. When you collect, you have to have your PPEs on and your, because you don't want to put your own DNA on the scene. 
and you need to package that evidence for chain of custody. So you need evidence bags, you need paper for talking about evidence bags. Um, if you can take one and send along. There we go. Each one must get an evidence bag. There we go. Um, you have to have evidence bags. You can have a boormarker plan ideas and you can have amazing collection kits. Where does it fit in? You've got a crime scene. You will recover evidence. It will be analyzed in the laboratory and eventually you will use it in court. And I do love that, that little joke there about the fingerprint expert. And uh, yes, you have your finger puppet master coming to play there. Okay, so what is your biological evidence? It's basically anything that has human DNA in it. Body fluids, body tissues, and anything that has body fluids on it. So it could be blood, it could be skin, saliva, there is a bite mark that will have saliva with it, tissue under the nails, hair, semen. Uh, you can probably not see there, but what it says is, sorry mate, no genes. <laughs> well, this one tried to get into the nightclub. So what you do is you can search, you can do a visual search, you can use lights, you can have, use a stereo microscope, you can use a magnifying glass, there are different ways of collecting for evidence. You have these crime lights of which your, <laughs> of, yes, we know about the ex-police person who were now fired because of, partly because of these crime light tenders being awarded. How many hundreds of thousands was it for one suitcase like this? Whoops, look at that. Okay. But these suitcases, each torch is at a different wavelength and it can then see different things. But with this you can see um, certain types of body fluids. But you have to look at it through either goggles or, I hate the word goggles, glasses. Or even just the, you just put this around the torch and then you go and look at it. Anyways. Um, so there's different wavelengths and you use a different, you have, use a different kind of torch for that and use different color glasses to look at it. But you have presumptive tests and you have confirmatory tests. Presumptive tests are the ones you do on the scene. Quick little test, is it human blood? Uh, it just gives you an indication of what you see there. It's not conclusive, you can't use it in court. It just saves you time and money of processing every single thing. So you use it, you carry out this presumptive test on a small amount. So the advantage is quick, you do it in real time, it's cheap and it's easy to perform. Disadvantages, you cannot say for definite, 100% surety. It doesn't yield quantitative, quantitative numbers because you need numbers in court. You can get false positives and the colors are subjective. I mean, how bright is bright? Yes, there we go. Luminol. Luminol, if you mix those together and you spray it, um, you can see a bright green or blue light appears if there's blood where you sprayed. The room must be dark to visualize it, so you have to make it dark. Sometimes you, if you're not sure, you can just use a box and put it over and have a little peak hole just to make it dark so that you can see. It's doesn't last long, it disappears after time, and UV can be used to make it much more prominent. So if you look through the glasses, it somewhat looks like if it's all over the place. But yes, in that instance, and in that, for example, here you can see if the room is lit and the room is dark, how you can see the, the um, luminance. So the reaction is short-lived, and you literally have to have your camera ready, everything set up, your um, your, your time that it's going to be open, everything ready. It's difficult to capture those results because it is so 
time sensitive. Yes, or where someone might have tried to to hide it, or even oh, this thing is sensitive, or even um, where it's dried, or even when someone uh, put a carpet over it and you remove it now and you can't see a blood stain, but then when you uh, um, use the luminol, you can and you can do it for long time after the fact, you can still see it. It appears like it's clean. There's nothing on the wall, and then you. Okay, you, but you can get false positives. So if it's the brown bear of America that shows positive with that, and you get that in South Africa, yes, the brown bear might positively give you or might give you a false positive. But how many brown bears do we have in South Africa? Okay, in South Africa you can buy Blue Star. That's the one we use for that. So to collect it. Um, you need to wear your PPEs, collect it in the proper manner. So, so what you do there is use forceps, use swabs, and you glove, you double glove. So for every single piece of evidence you collect, you use clean gloves, theoretically. And you remove the outer one and put new gloves on. And the reason why you double glove, I don't know if any of you have ever done it, I sweat like a pig inside those latex gloves. So if I take the latex gloves off and I try and get it in there, I need to dip my hands in a bucket of baby powder before I can get it in the next pair. But you double glove. It's also to make double sure you don't contaminate. If you use a swab, you only use one drop of water. So when they show you on that television how oh, that guy drips the water in there, you don't want that. You don't want, you only rotate the swab once. You swipe it through it once to collect the stain. Sometimes more is worse than little bit, especially when it comes with DNA. You don't saturate the swab. There's a double swabbing technique that's 2007, it's quite a while ago, that gave much better results. So, so what you do, I mustn't walk away so far. You swab once with the saturated swab in one direction and then flip the swab over in the perpendicular and then you take the second swab and you swab diagonally to your first swabs. So what you have your normal cotton swab, it's in an emergency you can use a cotton swab, they're not ideal, they actually have in one cotton swab there's two kilometers of microfiber in that swab. Uh, the new ones with a flocked swab it's only six meters of micro, but it's all over the place, much more surface for the substance to adhere to. So the objectives of packaging is to prevent contamination. So it's to maintain chain of, of evidence, but you need to write on the bag what's happening. So, and you need to make contemporaneous notes. Whatever you do, stop, write down a little bit. So what I want you to do is Normally when you have a crime scene evidence bag, you first write on the bag before you put the stuff in, because it, if it is a little silicon impression you made of a crowbar damage on a door, and you're going to write on it afterwards, you're going to damage, you're going to make indentations on that evidence. Um, but the idea is that you sign it over from one hand to the other, it must be signed. So this is the evidence bag, you can see at the top there's this yellow and blue. If you hold the yellow at the top and you then you can see you can flip the blue. So the idea is you pull the blue down and in that, like she's showing there, in that you grab the yellow and the yellow will come away. The yellow is just like a ribbon that comes away.